and I would like to add the country of my birth, Hungary, into this group, but they will play their game their way. And the United States now has troops deployed in Poland and in Romania. Is building a major air force base or re refurbishing a major air force base in Romania. Is probably going to build Camp Trump, which will be called Camp Mattis, probably not Camp Trump, but will be built. Um, we are at that point where we now have to begin to look beyond this moment. The question on the table is what is the relationship between the Atlantic partners? And I want to begin by looking at this from the American view, since all of you know how to look at it from the European view. The Atlantic relationship is one of two oceanic interests the United States has. The other is the Pacific. Of the two, from a trading point of view, the Pacific is more important than the Atlantic at this point, just quantitatively. Now, that changed in 1980, so it's a very new event in human history, but it is certainly the key. Second, the United States is an, lives on an island. North America is an island. Little Panama connects it. It is a maritime power. Like Britain, it lives and dies by the oceans. And every time it sets foot on land, it is immediately outnumbered and immediately endangered. At the same time, the United States has had a consistent foreign policy for the past 100 years. Two principles guide that policy. And it transcends every presidency and everything. Number one, that the US should be the dominant power in the North Atlantic and the Pacific. Number two, that no hegemonic power should emerge in Eurasia that can utilize the manpower and the resources in a systematic way, build fleets, and be able to challenge the United States at sea. You live and die by the Carpathians. We live and die by the Atlantic and the Pacific. When you look at it this way, you begin to see the foundations of the American side of the Atlantic Alliance. First, the United States stayed out of the First World War. It entered it three weeks after the Tsar abdicated and German troops were rushing to the front. It joined it because it understood that France and Britain might be defeated, and it rushed within six months over a million troops to stop the Germans. This was the first execution of this policy. And it was the first time in which the future of Europe was decided by actions of the United States which transformed the world, but the Europeans didn't realize it. The second time was when Germany once again arose, posing the same question, what is my relationship to the Russians? What is my relationship to the French? What will the British do? And executed the same strategy, take France out of the war. The United States position was, we want nothing to do with it. It was not that we were isolationist. That's nonsense. We were deeply involved in China. We were involved in the Philippines. We were deeply involved in trying to manage the Japanese. We were not involved in Europe because we could not believe that for the second time they were going to do this. When it came, when France fell after six weeks, and you must understand that when you talk about US-French relations, the French are tone deaf sometimes and not understanding how bitter the Americans were that they had to go to war in Europe because the French wouldn't fight. And when you saw the conflict between Trump and Macron, maybe neither of them knew where it came from, but they didn't like each other. 
We invaded Europe at the last minute, 1944, Normandy. This time we did not leave Europe. But the same question was on the table in the Cold War. What is the relationship between Russia and Germany? This time they had Eastern Germany, we had Western Germany, but the question of war and peace revolved around the question, what is the relationship between these two countries? So you'll notice that every time the question of hegemony by Germany or by Russia came up, the United States involved itself. When after 2014, the Ukrainian crisis came to a boil, the Americans involved themselves. It was in the DNA, if you will, the grand strategy. Not heavily, the Americans try very hard to be proportional. So the presence here is absolutely not enough for the Romanians. I mean, the Poles go crazy because they must have more. Not yet, maybe not at all. But also remember that in the Second World War and the Cold War, the Pacific was where we bled. You remember that for the United States, Europe was not the only war. The war over who controlled the Pacific Ocean between the United States and Japan were critical. And during the Cold War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, between them, almost 100,000 Americans died. So when the Europeans asked the question, what is the transatlantic relationship? The American answer is, what is Europe's commitment to the Pacific? To which the Europeans, of course, look and say, what are you talking about? This alliance is intended to protect us. It is not intended that we should take risks against you, for you. And uh, Ambassador Bayor and I have had many warm conversations over the European lack of understanding of what NATO is or should be. Okay? And he alluded to this. We disagree. As an American with two children in the military, the Pacific is what I watch. Korea, China. We are now in the process of creating what's called the Quad Treaty of Japan, Australia, the United States, and India. India, we'll see if they play. We, they have to be tempted. So we have a view of the world in which there are parts of Europe that matter and parts that don't. What matters to us in Europe? Poland and Romania. Not because we're sentimental about the Romanians and Poles, although the shitty city of Chicago is all Polish and you don't really get elected presidents if you don't have their vote. But it is not that. It is this is the line. We do not know what the Russians will do, what they are capable of doing, what they ultimately want. This we don't know. We are prepared with the minimal force which we call a tripwire. If they come across in Romania, they kill Americans. And they know we go crazy. And countries don't like America going crazy. Although we do it so easily and so well. So we are here for that reason. And our question on the alliance is, what is your commitment to our presence in Poland and Romania? Now, there's a kind of basic rule of a military alliance. You have to have a military. If there is no military, it's a cocktail party. And Brussels has excellent cocktail parties. But the point is that the European countries very rationally have reduced their military capability because expending large amounts is irrational from their point of view. The threat they have comes from the East, and in the moment it is minimal, they 
know that the United States is prepared for its own reasons to insert some force in Romania and Poland, and it knows it has over a million troops available. So if I were a German, my position would be that I want NATO to be a political organization in which basic issues such as the deployment of American forces in Poland is discussed and approved. And the Americans see NATO as a problem because if you go to NATO, you immediately will get a two-year study group and we don't work that way, not when troops are involved. In other words, from our point of view, the strategic requirements of 2018 are not being met by NATO in two senses. First, it is completely irrelevant as an organization to our trans-Pacific relationship, which is fine, we understand that. Secondly, it is not capable of being relevant to the intermarium because there's not enough force. The Americans back up their commitment with multiple divisions. Most European countries have trouble deploying a battalion. And the battalion is a gesture. Look, I've come. And we're supposed to be impressed. So this is not because the Europeans are lazy, incompetent. It is simply because their interests and ours have diverged. The, during the Cold War, NATO made perfect sense. OK, we had an enemy. He was in the center of Europe. We did not know how far he intended to go. He had massed 5,000 tanks. And we were going to have to absorb this attack. And the time and place of the combat would be the enemies. It's a very dangerous situation. The Germans understood this. And the Bundeswehr was a significant force. The Belgian and Dutch air forces were flying excellent aircraft. The French were being difficult, of course. They wouldn't be on the committee, but, you know. We had an understanding. I worked during these years for a while at Shape Technical Center in The Hague. And when we talked to our colleagues, we all understood what we were doing. There is no question that the Dane would come in and say, I don't feel like being part of this exercise. Or that the Greeks would, even the Turks were there. That was because we had a common understanding. And that was because the geopolitical re reality required it. The geopolitical reality has shifted. It does not require such an alliance. The Europeans want to keep the alliance as a symbol of the commitment of the United States to European defense. Who is attacking them? But more to the point, they do not see our commitment to European defense in Poland and Romania. They see that as provocative. We understand. They don't think there's a problem from Russia. The United States is again provoking the Russians, and they would like us not to do this. We're not listening. So the transatlantic relationship is strained not because Donald Trump is a jerk. He's a jerk. And not because Macron is short. He's very short. <laughs> it is being strained by the fundamental realities of geopolitics. There is not a synergy between the two. There's not a symmetry. This leaves. Poland and, Ru and Romania in a very difficult position. In order to defend against a Russian attack, hypothetically, the United States must send reinforcements. Those reinforcements have a number of routes they can take. The most obvious one is landing in Cherbourg and being rushed by rail across Germany. During, World War, during the Cold War, this was understood. It was, there was an exercise called Reforger. It was exercised every year, and the, the deployment was practiced. Will the Germans and the French permit the transit of US forces in the event of an ambiguous 
So by ambiguous, I mean arising in, in Lithuania of Russians. Uh, a debate over precise borders and boundaries. The Russians will not present an outright attack. They will present an ambiguous provocation that can be interpreted as not a threat. And therefore, they will measure the extent of commitment and do the most important thing. Will the German rail lines be available for the transport of troops? Forget the question of will German troops fight. Focus on the question will they permit. And therefore, they look at the Polish position and the Romanian position as a danger to them. The Germans look at the Russians as someone they can deal with. They are dealing with them. Nord Stream is just an example of the fact that they don't see the need for this. The Americans don't see the need for it either, but just in case, we're going to be here. The Poles and the Romanians can't leave. So George asked the question, what is the 100 years of Romania? Right here. This is where you were all the time. This is where you would be for the next 100 years. And this is the important fact, which is Romania is where it is. The Carpathians in the north, a flat plain in the east, and Ukraine, who knows where. So this is where you are. France is far away. Germany has understandings. Every time Gerhard Schroeder talks, I shudder. I hope he's talking for himself. I don't think he is. So where are we on this relationship across the Atlantic? Well, from the American point of view, this is a very troubling relationship. When the president, Trump, you know, said this is that this relationship is obsolete, somebody told him that it was obsolete. It was a very good point. When Merkel said after that, well, that's the final straw. We will take care of ourselves. I think she felt we'd be upset by this thought. The Germans will take care of themselves. Macron has suggested that there should be a European army. We love it. It's called NATO. It was under joint command. But by all means, let there be a European army. Who will command it? The Germans or a committee? I mean, how you're going to have an army, somebody has to be in charge, what government will it answer to? A general likes to know who's going to fire him. So these are things that when we talk to Europe, it seems incoherent when we get back. It, we, we can't get coherent answers. They say things like, we'll form an army, but we have no belief that they mean it, and they would not like it. We could be an ally then. So this is where we are today. We are fortunate in this, which I'll end on, which is that Russia is now weakened. One of the things I said in the next 100 years is that Russia cannot sustain this. The Soviet Union fell when two things happened. Russian defense spending soared and oil prices collapsed. Right now, Russian defense spending is Sword. I mean, it depends which numbers you take from them. They, but if they're doing half of what they say they're doing, they're spending more money. More important, oil prices are in the 50s again. Okay? That is an arithmetic problem. So the real question here is, and this is the fundamental question to be looked at, is does Russia solve this problem was the collapse of the Soviet Union merely the first step of Russian devolution? Not the final step, as everybody thought. Another wave of devolution is coming. Or will the Russians respond out of desperation with increased aggressiveness? This is, was the conversation I had uh, in the 1980s, trying to guess what the Russians will do. 
Now, the good news is they are weaker than they look. The bad news is that even weaker than they look is pretty strong compared to you. So we are now at a transition position where my expectation is Russia will have a disintegrative moment and cause certain problems as a result of that that will not go quiet. The Gorbachev model isn't, was a one-time only. You don't get another Gorbachev model on the, in disintegration. But this is what we are looking at. So we have Ukraine as a frozen conflict. From the American point of view, it is a quite satisfactory situation. The Russians are over there, and they're not in the Carpathians. From the Russian point of view, this is quite satisfactory. The Americans are over here, and they're not in Smolensk. We don't really care who owns the Crimea, because, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a naval base that can be attacked readily and taken down. Um, plus, we're not going to war in the Balk, in the Black Sea. But the point is, all of these things must be taken account when we take a look at the Atlantic relationship. I will end on this one note. Turkey. Do not for a moment think that this is over. Turkey is a member of NATO, is hostile to many of the NATO members, still attends the meetings at SHAPE, but more important than that, it is redefining itself. It is redefining itself in certain fundamental ways. This is the heir to the Ottoman Empire. It has interests in the Balkans. Uh, it has interests in the Middle East. It has interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. And you're beginning to see these interests manifest themselves. So when the question comes up, what is Romania's position, the answer is, Sometimes it's a bulwark against Russia, sometimes against Turkey, and in some happy times nobody wants it, but you're governed by people you can't stand, like Ceausescu. So the answer here is national power. And national power consists of military power, and that in turn consists above all of economic power. And that means creating a dynamic economy that takes advantage of your one strategic value, the intellect of your citizens. My company uses a Romanian IT company to handle all their IT needs. They're very good, and above all, they're cheap. Oh, I love that. This is the basis of national power. Once that happens, once you take advantage of this, then the building of an air base in the middle of Transylvania becomes a lot easier to conceive of. Once being your ally becomes easier. So I will argue and I will close with a point that I take very seriously. The foundation of American military power is its economic power. The foundation of every country's power is economic power. Otherwise you become a dependency and a drain. But when I look at Romania, when I look at Hungary, when I look at Poland, I see a region of some of the great intellects at the lowest cost. And we're going to buy the whole bunch of them and ship them to the United States. And unfortunately, that's what's happening. So this is something that you must look at as if you were designing a new tank. It is just a series. On that, I will step down, and you can attack me all you want. I'll enjoy it. was really superb and uh, like always uh, um, extremely to the point, extremely provoking at the same uh, time. Um, but what I liked most in your presentation, Mr. Friedman, was uh, the fact that you really uh, went to the um, key questions that define the geopolitical situation that Romania is in. So you, you really targeted it to this uh, to this audience so so thank you for that um, 
And yes, uh, uh, very prov provoking thoughts about uh, NATO. I hope uh, we will um, uh, we will come back on this. What I would uh, suggest, uh, I mean, I would open the floor immediately for some some questions. I have a couple of questions, like every serious moderator that uh, uh, exactly. Uh, but I think the audience uh, it, it's already uh, very much warmed up uh, that. Uh, Many, many might be ready to shoot. So, who would be first? Please, if you could introduce yourself and. Surprisingly, not the same amount of uh, we probably deserve in this geopolitical environment. Thank you, sir. I think that there are two ways. The first is that the investments in Germany, the investments in Japan are in the context of a Soviet threat. So we scaled the urgency not to Japan's needs, but their own, South Korea as well. The second is that American investment and I was you know, part of trying to raise them, finds complexities in Romania that are not in keeping with how we manage it. So the primary source of money in the 50, in 1945 was the federal government. We're not gonna do that again. The primary source of money at this point is private, and there is a surplus of money in the United States looking to invest. When we look at your energy industry and other minerals that you have, investment in them is very complex. From an American point of view, the time frame for decisions in business and the way in which decisions are made are incompatible with the American model. If an American private equity firm has $10 billion to invest, waiting six months without getting any revenue from that, is not possible. For the Romanians, a question like this is certainly something worth thinking about for, you know, there's a lot of people to consult. So I would argue that the reason for the lack of money is one that was a different time, and second, because Romania has not configured itself for a national emergency. Romania has not said it is a fundamental interest to my country that I receive investment and economic growth, which I think it is. Therefore, I am going to change the rules whereby investors can come in. The expectation that the United States will come in, well, it was true about the Marshall Plan, but that was a very special circumstance with the Soviet threat looming when we had to do something. This is a different case. But I would also argue that apart from appeasing the American investors, which is not a trivial thing, I think, it is in the interest of Romania to restructure its economy for rapid and agile decision making, to make it parallel to how the rest of the world operates. I heard many times, this is the way we do it in Romania. To which the answer is, well, I'm not gonna put money in Romania. So my answer is, I agree that Romania, I believe deeply that Romania could be a tremendously valuable thing, country, uh, economically, but you have to decide you want it. Don't look at us. Romania for about eight years. Um, my question is about the tripwire strategy that you mentioned. Um, so I think we can all agree that Baltic and Black Seas are no man's seas, right? The anti-access area denial systems are too advanced right now. So in case Turkey does close the Strait of Hormuz and Germany does say no to the railway shipments, how can you actually bring the reinforcements to give us the confidence that uh, they, they will arrive? Well, you may not have the confidence, but what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> your confidence is not what we're depending on. I guess we would then have to rethink our our uh, 
policies. What policy will you adopt? No clue. <laughs> the, the point is this. The U.S. has military threats in Korea, a military confrontation in the South China Sea, potential issues in the Persian Gulf, potential issues all over the world. This is one of them. If the United States deployed full necessary force to each of these conditions, even with the size of our military, which is massive, we would run out of room for maneuver. So we necessarily have a tripwire strategy because we have more responsibilities than we can cope with on a direct commitment. Most of those will never materialize. Most of those won't happen. And, you know, the Japanese want us to have a major force off of Korea. This would make them feel better. Well, you know, I'm not sure it would make me feel better because what would we leave uncovered? So we have to have proportional deployment. To have greater deployment, we would expect your neighbors to provide more force. Okay? But if you are going to depend entirely on yourselves and the United States, then you have to take into account America's other commitments, needs, and interests. And this is one of the things that the Europeans don't do. They say, we don't trust you to take care of us. And the question is, well, guys, look at the world that we live in, not your little regional problems. I say that because I love saying it to Germans. But you're a minor regional pro power. What does it matter? It's good to say that. <laughs> But we can't pre-deploy that level of force in so many places. Therefore, we have to have the kind of policy we had in the Cold War. We deployed force in Germany, but it was the reinforcements through Reforger that were going to solve the problem. Because we had a war in Vietnam, or a war on Korea, we were busy fighting other places. Not necessarily wisely, but fighting in other places. So that's the answer. And the point is, I agree this is a difficult position to be in, but this is where the Romanians and the Poles should be talking to the Germans and the French, not us. You know. Can I do with these one at a time? At this, you know, a, a pure blue water policy is difficult. In an age when, since World War II, the primary threat is from the air. So we have the danger of missiles from land-based systems coming out of their navy. This depends on their reconnaissance capability, and that depends on their satellites. Because if they can't see where we are, they can't hit us. So a lot of our time, this is why we're talking about our Space Force. We, there's a discussion in the United States, which is that, look, the, the earliest battlefield of naval control is no longer surface warships. It is missiles from Chinese land bases targeted by their satellites. So that war has to be started there. The complexity of war today is enormous. The fact that we must have our buffers is true, but we're not going to fight wars like it was the Battle of Jutland. And we're not even going to fight them as if it were Pearl Harbor. It'll be more like Pearl Harbor. It is not an air-land battle anymore. It's an air-land space battle.
how is going to be destroyed the equilibrium between Russia, United States, and the European Union? Well, because we're going to have uh, Chinese investments well, in the future. Firstly, at this point, China is reeling economically. Its non-performing loans in China are the staggering amount. They have made many statements about what they're going to invest. How much of that investment ever arrives and what form it takes? I was in Kazakhstan talking to an extremely high official who was complaining about the Chinese coming in and building roads with Chinese crews. He didn't need the roads, he needed the jobs. In the Pakistan we saw them rebuffed. The idea of the, the simple idea of building a road through Central Asia is insane. This is the most unstable region you can imagine. And the only way to stabilize it is occupying it with an army, which certainly the Chinese have, but it may be Uzbekistan would rather they didn't. But more than that, sea lane maritime trade is much, much cheaper than land trade. The cost of shipping goods by a road is very, very high. The cost of shipping by sea is much lower. They have de-emphasized, so there are a bunch of concepts rolled up here. The first of Chinese investment. This is, on the private side, primarily capital outflow, capital flight. So if China is doing so great, why would anybody want to invest in Romania? And the answer is because they want to invest anywhere that's not in China and get their money out. So the Chinese are now cracking down on that private investment. They're using money investment as a strategic lever. They'll go to Serbia and promise huge money, and that hit, hits the headlines. What we do is we track the investments. <laughs> See, you know, somehow they take a while and not quite as much. It's like dealing with venture capitalists. If I invest $40 million in your company tomorrow, six months later, maybe. Uh, don't confuse the PR that they do with their actual capabilities of investment. Right now, they have been hit hard by U.S. tariffs. And even before then, they were in trouble. So I, I don't take this, I never took it seriously. You know, roads to Uzbekistan? Of course, they'll build a road anywhere. You pay for it, they'll send the crews, it'll be fine, you have a road. You could use some roads. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Joanna Constantin. I will kindly ask you uh, if it's possible to make some comments. Actually, my question is uh, related to the first part of the title, to transatlantic relation. If you'd like to make some comments over this relation under the light of the latest development regarding the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Iran. Re regarding the what? the Iranian nuclear deal, please, and um, because somehow it's going to be relevant also for Europe. Uh, do you believe that Europe have the strength to stand up uh, to safeguard the, uh, the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, uh, especially under the, after the latest development in France and Denmark? So the Thank answer you. is Europe, the first answer is Europe has this more than enough strength if it wants to marshal it and use it. This is not a question of whether Europe has the ability. It doesn't want to spend the money in, on that and so what it spends its money on. So the Iranian situation has become extremely di difficult. Because of the American defeat in Iraq and American withdrawal from Iraq, Iranians have deployed, essentially dominate Iraq. They dominate Lebanon they have a conflict going with Israel and possibly Russia and Syria, and they're involved in the Yemen war. If you take a look at the map, Saudi Arabia is surrounded by. The American response is no longer primarily military. We, we've learned in the Middle East, don't do that. What we do is we put sanctions. And that was one of the reasons why we don't care if they have a nuclear weapon, really, because they're not going to have one but it gave us a justification for putting sanctions. So now we have strikes going on in southwest Iran. 
unrest in the bazaars, there's tremendous economic pressure on Iran. So the real question here is this. Iran has made this massive investment in this regional hegemony. It's got it, but it's thin. It's not a major presence. It's a thin presence. And the U.S. has sponsored an alliance between Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. This is a counter up. Now, the Khashoggi killing, whatever, I don't want to get into who did what to whom. It was the perfect target to break up that alliance. And the absolute outrage of the Turks was touching. I mean, Erdogan is absolutely committed to journalist rights. And this is the one thing we know about him. I have no idea what was going on there, but what we wound up with was a bullet at the heart of the anti-Iranian alliance. Could the Europeans play a role in this? Sure. Will they? No. Why should they get involved in something that is not directly in their interest? The Europeans are rational. So we don't want to get involved either. But the Israelis have no choice. They're there. And in all of geopolitics, remember the founding principle is you're there, I'm not. Let me know what you're going to do. Thank you. My name is Bleba Cesar. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the, about the, um, uh, the Romanian IT specialists, and we are proud that our connections are, are treasured in your country. But um, regarding the uh, younger generations, um, we, Romania, as well as Bulgaria, face uh, a process of, uh, of migration to, towards Western Europe. And uh, I believe that this process can uh, serve, uh, can be a, a serious, a serious, ah, a serious issue. Um, I want to ask: uh, Do you believe that uh, the shrinking population, the brain drain of Romania and, Bul um, and Bulgaria, uh, can uh, can be a, a weakness for the for the defense of NATO? And uh, can it be a, an issue to be discussed at the future NATO summit? Thank you. First of all, young people always move around. They think they're the only ones who ever thought of doing it. So, I mean, yeah, you're moving around, but you're still here. Let me know when you leave. The, the point that has to be made, however, is that the decline of population in an industrial country is a serious matter. In a technical country, it may not be. Japan is a country already experiencing population contraction, but it's holding its GDP steady, which means per capita GDP rises. This idea of declining population being bad is as insane as, as I grew up, population boom, we will all be starving. So the only thing that the mongers have is catastrophe. If this were an industrial age where Large numbers of workers had to be working to produce steel. Then you might have a problem. But this is an age where I can put out a magazine with a tenth of what it would have taken a year ago, all of it being put into intellectual work. So ask the question, what will your GDP be? But what you point out is, I think, very valid. Whether or not you leave or not, the conversion from a primarily industrial, com commodity-driven economy to an intellectual one is of fundamental importance. First, you don't control the price of natural materials. So they can really go down. Second, um, you don't want to be doing the labor for foreign companies, okay? Because they're going to give you all the unproductive labor <laughs> to do. You want to be able to build your own organizations, fewer and fewer people, 
so the declining workforce actually works for you. And this was my point before about restructuring the Romanian economy. Or getting rid of the structures and just letting it go. My question is uh, the following. Uh, what would you estimate to be the probability of a uh, disruptive uh, event in Russia? Because we know in history we had 1917, we had 1990s, and so on. I, I would put them as fairly high. Russia is a third world country. It exports natural resources. It does not control the price of natural resources. So the fluctuation there, Russia takes taxes or royalties from the oil. It takes that money and distributes it to the oblasts. They distribute it to the teachers. So if you remember what happened with the Yeltsin, teachers weren't getting paid. Policemen were getting half and this became a serious problem. The Russians have two reserve funds. One they've depleted. That was a small one. They've cut into the second one, but it's still there. So what we look at is the reserve funds and the price of oil. $80 they can do. Now they put out a statement just two or three days ago that they're budgeting to $40, and that'll be good enough. Yeah, right. Uh, this is what we're looking at. When we start seeing people not getting paid, and it won't be in Moscow, and it won't be in St. Petersburg, it'll be in Tomsk or somewhere else, this is what we have to watch for. At that point, the situation rapidly unravels. So I don't only think about 92. I think about 2000 when Putin took over from Yeltsin, because that was a pivotal year where we basically, whoa, this, we can't keep going this way. And he used his influence with the oligarchs for transfer of funds and things of that sort. It was a very complex matter, but he pulled them out. Oil prices rising didn't hurt him either. Right? So do I see it? I don't see anything raising oil prices. The reason is the United States. We have now invented a new way to make oil, and Houston wants to sell it. And Houston can produce at a price much lower than Russian Arctic oil. Okay? And so the problem they have is that the United States has radicalized OPEC. Neither the Saudis nor the Russians nor Washington can control a Houston businessman. And that means that the pressure will grow. Plus, the world is going to recession. Uh, Germany contracted last quarter. Japan contracted last quarter. The Ch Ch Chinese numbers are garbage, but they contracted. Uh, our stock markets are falling dramatically. And prices of all commodities are falling. So I, it's been 10 years since the last recession. The United States has never gone more than 10 years since World War II without a recession. And we're seeing the various leading indicators. That's going to hit all exporting countries. And it should not only be Russia you're watching, but Germany. Germany exports 50% of its GDP, 48% of its GDP, almost half. So out of every dollar of GDP, 50 cents comes from foreign customers. Countries that do that find out, like China, that they really depend on their customers. If the United States goes into recession, the first thing we will cut is uh, machine production and Mercedes. And that's what the Germans are selling. In, and we are, outside of Europe, the number one customer for German goods. So when we look at the question of Russia and we look at the question of Europe, 
bear in mind that the U.S., the largest importer in the world, is probably going into a cyclical, healthy recession. That's what we do. And that's going to hit all... We th what we've had since 2008 is an exporter crisis. In 2008, our belief was that if you're an exporter, you're more efficient than if you're a massive importer. In 2008, with the worldwide recession, we discovered that all classes, after 2014 collapse, all class classes of exporters were highly vulnerable. Germany avoided this. Now, the interesting thing about Germany, and I'm sorry to go on, but this is important, is banking system is not very healthy. The last time I saw a major economic power with a bad, bad uh, banking system was Japan in 1989. It was growing very fast, but the GDP growth doesn't tell you anything about rate of return on capital. So you can cut your prices to nothing. And so I think we're, we're entering a period where we really have to look at how much room Russia has to run because oil prices will go down with lack of demand. We have to look at Germany. These are the two ones to look at now. And this has been a really excellent discussion, uh, cutting to the essence of geopolitics. But my, my, my question is the following. What about uh, the impact of uh, new disrupting techno technologies upon the classic geopolitics and the, what we see, the, the use of non-violence influence, sometimes with strategic effects? Uh, how do you see the digital battlefield impacting classical geopolitics. So, to begin with this. Yeah. The cell phone was introduced by the U.S. Army in 1985 as a communications tool. The camera in here was introduced by the National Reconnaissance Office to take remote satellite and remote pictures. The GPS system was under Navy contract, but it was primarily designed to target uh, nuclear missiles more effectively. The dual use, of the two things to understand is when we go take a look at many of the developments, they emerge from geopolitics, changing geopolitics for military reasons. Okay? I, I did this lecture once to a group of millennials. It was fun to jerk around. Uh, you know, go through the phone and this phone is, you know, the internet connection was DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project. Every bit of this phone was created in the United States by the Defense Department. But in the United States, the U.S. government may not patent anything. So anything they have that is unclassified, it's yours. And that's how Steve Jobs created the iPhone. So my argument is, we really have to understand how disruptive technology emerges for the past 200 years. From the steam engine that was created for the British Navy and revolutionized the Industrial Revolution, to aircraft which were invented for their own sake but really commoditized in the World War I. So we, we can go through all of these. The railroads were introduced to mobilize troops, to bring troops to the battlefield. That's how they were paid for. We think of it as some kid in his garage brilliantly thinking of it. I'm waiting to find that thing. Um, Gates took an operating system that he bought from somebody else and came up with a way to do it. He wouldn't sell computers. He would sell the operating system or the license. Disruptive technologies are intimately related to geopolitics. So during the Cold War, so much of the technology that we now take for granted was emerging because the government would pay for it, would pay for the R&D, the U.S. government in particular. Um, nuclear power. <laughs> then it was commoditized by others. The question of other things, such as strategic communications, which you raised, 
or in jest. We had that in World War II. That was called the BBC. And all of Europe listened to it, and mostly they told the truth. Occasionally they threw something in. During the Cold War, it was Radio Free Europe, that I'm sure you guys listen to it occasionally. We mostly tell the truth. <laughs> Whenever. And it was Radio Moscow. I listened to Radio Moscow. But the point is, it's not new. Propaganda is not new. It has an effect. It rarely has a strategic effect. It has an effect in the context of broader military operations, political operations, and so on. Hello, uh, my name is uh, George Simeon. I am a president of an NGO that is promoting uh, the unification between Romania and uh, Moldova. I would like, like to ask you what is uh, your opinion on the subject? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take it, don't take it. It's just don't, if you get in trouble with the Russians or something, don't call on us. <laughs> No, I mean, the qu this is a sort of a local question that you'd have to first tell me what do you gain by integrating them. A bigger country is a more powerful country. Or, or a more vulnerable country because the other powers will see you as potentially expansionist and do something like bomb you. So the question always is, you know, I have this conversation in Budapest. It's about you, by the way. <laughs> I say, so what are you going to gain from this? And the answer is, in most cases, you have to have a very good answer for launching a military operation. And on the Moldova thing, I'm not an expert. I've been to Moldova. Personally, I don't need it. You do? Okay. I can't hear you. I can't Hi. hear you. Thank you. My name is Katarina Bulgora, and I'd like to know if you think that uh, the rise of uh, populism in Europe is a consequence, a result of uh, the hybrid war. A populist party is the one I don't like. <laughs> if, if I like it, then it's called by its name. What is happening in Europe is a rise of nationalism. And nationalism is rising because of the failure of internationalism. The EU has not been successful. It has intruded in the internal life of countries gratuitously. And it has not, and it has accepted the fact that Southern Europe, in particular, will live in a catastrophic position, still with unemployment at 15, 20, 25 percent, depending on the region. And they will rationalize it in a million ways why it's someone else's fault, which is what we would do in Mexico or El Salvador, but we don't claim to be one country with them. So my answer is basically the EU was founded on the principle that the nation remains intact and on the principle that the EU can tell the nation what to do. One or the other works. The foundation of liberal democracies is the right to national self-determination. That means elections. And what the EU has done is not respected the outcome of elections. It has selected the winners and said that they violated this or that. We now see the EU at war with Britain, involving Ireland, attacking Italy, attacking Poland, attacking... Um, Romania, Hungary. So this is a kind of crazy idea that we're going to have a European Union. It will tell countries what to do. The countries won't do it. And then the Secretariat will attack the countries. This is the origin of the rise of populism, which is that the expectation of what the EU would deliver wasn't delivered. And to me, the obliviousness of Brussels as to the fact that they really failed. In 2008, a catastrophe was created in Southern Europe and Germany and other countries were supposed to help out. 
And the Germans said, wait a minute, these are Greeks. So this would be, as in the United States, they have a great problem, and Texas didn't help New York. Actually, Texas doesn't want to help New York, but it wouldn't have a choice. The, the, the point is this. What is the EU? Is it a federation? Is it a treaty organization? If it's a treaty organization, let them go. You had a free trade zone that worked extremely well. You know, France did not tell Poland what the judges should do. Or, you know, we have NAFTA. NAFTA is as big as the EU. Our population is a half a billion people. And our um, GDP is just slightly higher than yours. The Mexicans don't tell the Americans how their schools should be taught. And, and so on. Now, you've got the EU. You've got the reaction. You can't deny that you have the reaction. So you can say the reaction comes from evil people. Or you can take responsibility and say, look, we have got to change something that we do. The unwillingness of the EU to evolve in the face of really serious problems is the origin of what you call populism, or what I call secessionism. I want out. Most of Europe doesn't agree, but I'm sure the problem will be solved very shortly. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the solution then. Hello, Florian Koiber. Just a small question related with the question uh, of uh, Mr. Sorin Bukhari. How do you see this rapid evolution of technology, IT and C, but is not developed by the state, as you mentioned, but is developed by the private companies, which, by the way, invest more than many governments are investing. For example, only Oracle invests more investment than Pentagon is doing now. How do you see this problem? Is because our government has to rely on Chinese technology or other countries' technology, not invest as it used to be the driving force is not government, but the private sector. Did you see a problem with that? Sorry. Well, back to when, I, when I take a look at the history of technology, uh, it was always, in the United States, a public-private enterprise. The railroads were really massively built for the Civil War. The telegraph lines went up for the Civil War. Out of that came AT&T and others. There is, I think, the distinction in public and private, in many cases, is academic. They are intimately connected in various ways, and they do. Oracle spends a great deal of money most of it on marketing. The amount they actually spend on R&D is another question. <laughs> so when, when a company, you know, companies don't have to publish, publicly held publish, the accurate numbers on R&D because they're considered to be leakers. So yes, they have invented things, but I always take a look at Oracle as a perfect example. Oracle was created by the US Navy. The US Navy, needed a database to handle certain things. And I know the admiral who was in charge of that, and Oracle emerged from that. Now, Oracle is a huge com company because it sells all over the world, but the basic R&D that created that database was as a radical idea at the time, was funded by the Navy. So it's hard. Uh, please remember that a week after the court said they wouldn't intervene, the FBI miraculously figured out how to decrypt it. <laughs> they, whoever it was, okay, this was a test case. They wanted to have a case in which they could act. I will guess, I have no idea, they had it decrypted before. But they needed to have this test to see if the courts would intervene. I mean, we get down to this level, I mean, the political level is itself its own universe. Uh, it, it plays within the reality of the air and the sea around it, but it has enormous complexities. Um, and very frequently, those secrets are held more deeply than the geopolitical secrets. So 
I will argue that one of the things I try to do is stay on the geopolitical level because I can understand that. Knowing geopolitically that Oracle came from the U.S. Navy and maintains those contracts and everything, I remember that. But if I get down to right now how much they spend on marketing and how much they spend on this and how much they spend bribing congressmen, I don't know. Thank you very much. <coughs> My name is uh, Michael Bragno, and uh, I would uh, I have a, a question. Closer, uh, closer to the mic. I would have a question um, uh, quite uh, similar and related to the last answer we, we had. Uh, we have seen a lot of um, discussions about Russia threats uh, to Romania and to Eastern Europe in general, and um, uh, I want to, to underline the fact that uh, these threats are not only military, we have seen various other um, other uh, discussions on this topic, like the um, the hybrid war, or like Russia uh, involved uh, getting involved more and more into politics by financing nationalists and populists and uh, even extremist parties in in some areas. Uh, and uh, I would be very uh, interested in how would uh, the American uh, administration policy would be to. Uh, to address such uh, such topics and to maintain the pro-American uh, sentiment in the in the in the region, uh, in an eventual post George Soros Foundation era. Thank you. Well, to be very simple, the Russians have been ad advocating and practicing agitprop for years. They were funding political parties in Europe, in the United States, through the Intercomintern. Uh, so I take a look at this wonderful attack on the U.S. elections. What came from it? For the first time since the Vietnam War, the entire Democratic Party is anti-Russian. And Congress passed over Trump's head more sanctions. So the outcome of these things that the Russians have always done has usually been catastrophic for the Russians. So they had a massive uh, agitprop program in Weimar, Germany, supporting various parties. They got Hitler. The problem with all of this is this is not a refined weapon. Okay? It is propaganda. And it blows up in different directions in different ways, and it's unpredictable. For the Russians, the attempt to hack the email, which produced very little, uh, it did not influence the election, but it certainly led to serious economic problems for the Russians. Uh, you don't need George Soros for the Russians to screw up. I mean, one of the things that every, uh, this region always interests me. On the one hand, you think the Russians are 10 feet tall, 10 meters tall. On the other hand, they continually screw up. So you were saying in the 1980s that they were sponsoring this entire anti-war movement, anti-nuclear movement in Europe. They're also sponsoring the Bader Meinhof gang and the Red Army Brigade. They respond all of them. On the other hand, they collapsed, the Soviets. So there is not a clear connection between successful agitprop and an outstanding geopolitical solution. So in 1980s, it was a time when you knew that Ramirez, who was the jackal, was in Budapest and being managed through there, and that th the gray wolves were being managed by Bulgarian intelligence, which I don't even want to think about. <laughs> and, and so all, all of these things you would have. And in spite of all these brilliant moves, they collapsed. The Russians collapsed. So you, no, you have to take a look at the outcome and this is the whole problem of this region. They are not outcome-based in their analysis. They see the Russians doing something, and they think it's obviously effective. And in most cases, with Russians going back to the, the Tsar, their attempts didn't work. The 1980s to me, which I lived through closely, uh, the 1980s to me was being overwhelmed by Russian you know, operations. It's only to discover that they were hollowing out internally. Sometimes they were trying to play upon others also, and 
the Russian trade, so that's what concerns the neighborhood. But, uh, but, 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 I know. but we have to understand precisely what is the price. What is it that you're afraid of? How do you manage it? And how do you counter it? Yeah. In the case of the attack on the American election, managing it was doing nothing. They'd blow themselves up. And the Democratic Party, which is pro-Russian, <laughs> became anti-Russian. Congratulations. This was very successful at your front. Yeah. I, I, I know Mr. Friedman has a, a tight uh, schedule, so I will pass it over to the key host, to Rector uh, Prokopia, for the final words, please. I will keep uh, the ending uh, short. We had a discussion uh, today, uh, in fact, a couple of discussions, and I think uh, the main conclusion of our discussion should be we keep going with this dialogue. Today, this night, it was the first dialogue between George Friedman and uh, students, professors, and guests of CNSPA. But I would like to have your uh, promise. We'll go further uh, next year, and we develop this uh, kind of interaction between uh, you and uh, us, a direct interaction, because, because in fact, in this room, uh, initially, initially, regularly scheduled the class of geopolitics of Professor uh, Paul Dobrescu. Uh, so you are in this classroom through your uh, uh, books, but uh, we hope uh, in the future we'll be uh, also in direct contact, as I mentioned. What I've learned is enormously. I like arguing. It's fun. <laughs> and also you learn a great deal. And being blunt is a very good way to do it. So I thank all of you, and to the ambassadors among you who are not used to blunt, I apologize. <laughs> thank you very much. Ambassadors are blunt, but not in the open. I, I can afford it.